Good evening, Lake Washington School District families, staff, students, and community. Welcome to the second of two live events we have broadcast this week. My name is John Holman, Superintendent of Lake Washington School District. Thank you for joining us tonight. Last night, we shared information with the community related to the district's equity work, elementary education, and special education programs and services. These recorded sessions are available on the Return to School Task Force page of our district website. I would like to recognize our board of directors that are present tonight. I once again would like to thank them for joining us in supporting the ongoing work of planning to reopen school this fall. Tonight, you'll hear from our central administrators regarding three more topics. It is important to note that in all our work, we are intentional to ensure that our values and goals as a district are present in our decision making. We aim to prioritize students' experience, safety, and outcomes while ensuring that, ensuring that we don't implement systems that lead to further marginalization of specific populations within our district. Our commitment is to each and every student while providing a world-class education and preparing students to be future ready. The first presentation tonight will focus on secondary education. The team will walk through the multiple parts and pieces involved with implementing a remote middle and high school model our efforts to make the curriculum and content accessible, rigorous and beneficial to students, and information about secondary scheduling. Additionally, you will receive an update about accelerated programs, career and technical education programs, and the professional learning all staff are participating in as we lead up to the start of school. The second presentation will focus on our family technology supports. Given the great dependency on technology, our team has thought through and partnered with a number of internal and external groups to provide high quality support for our families. The team will walk through a number of items related to our implementation of technology related to outcomes such as classroom teams, device access, and hardware support. We are also excited to share with you tonight one of our parent resources that we are developing to provide the necessary information to our families. Finally, our team focused on health and safety will provide information about the plans requirements and work related to the physical health and safety for both students and staff. Public schools are accountable to a number of different agencies and our health and safety team has taken the various requirements and put them together in a cohesive planning document which will be implemented at all of our sites throughout the school district. I hope you enjoy your evening and find the presentations informative and beneficial. I would like to introduce Mike Van Orden, Associate Superintendent of Teaching and Learning. Mr. Van Orden will introduce the first presenter and topic tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holman. I want to start tonight by saying thank you again to our families. We know you've been anticipating information to plan for the year, and we truly appreciate our partnership with you as we move into this new year of school. I also wanted to take a moment to thank the many teachers and administrators who worked throughout the summer and continue to plan and prepare for the start of the school year at the secondary level, along with all the people in our district who will be working harder than ever to serve our students this coming year. As Dr. Holman mentioned tonight, Dr. Rose will be sharing the latest information about our secondary program. And while we know that you'll be hearing, what you'll be hearing tonight won't answer all your questions, our goal is to make sure you leave with a better idea of what the year will look like. We also want to assure you that there are thousands of people who are working in our district and are committed to serving you and your children. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rose, our Director of Teaching and Learning, to share information about our secondary program. All right. Thank you, Mike. Like Mike said, I'm Jen Rose, Director of Teaching and Learning, and I want to acknowledge, as Mike said, there are many unknowns, and this has been a difficult time as we, as we work through what those unknowns are. This summer, we have had literally hundreds of teachers and administrators really working diligently to plan for this fall. And it's actually been something that's been, um, as much as the unknowns are difficult, it's been exciting and fun. And as we get closer to the year, we're just really looking forward to working with your students this year and delivering our, our usual high class program to your, to your students. So tonight, what we'd like to do is walk you through some of the process and the context for the resources that we've developed. We like to share the guidance that we are giving teachers and, and the frame for which teachers will be working with your students. And we'd like it to help you understand what a day might look like and what a week might look like and the kinds of learning that your students will experience as they go through this year. We'd like to also share a little bit about grading and some of the instructional outcomes that we're planning for for your students. Like I shared, we had a large task force this year that was pulled together that actually has been working together since April as a task force as we plan for the remote learning at that time and then monitor the progress. 
That group had over 50 teachers and administrators from multiple different content areas, many specialists. And I just have to, again, as Mike said, recognize all of their hard work and dedication and the excitement and joy they brought to the work and planning for working with your students. We as a group looked at the comments that you provided over the spring about your experience in remote learning. And that was, became central to our thinking about planning for this fall. So we looked at these different groups. We found focused work in these different groups and came up with different deliverables and outcomes that we'll share with you tonight. There also were content area work groups happening at the same time. So in every content area, we had specialists and groups of teachers coming together to identify essential learning for this coming year with the recognition of any challenges from last spring. These teachers were so thoughtful in thinking about the um, high leverage, the high impact standards that we want your students to learn this year. And we thought about them in a vertical alignment, not just what students need to learn this year, but thinking about that in what they need for each year so that they're really successful in meeting their goals. These groups work together all summer long and are, are in the next week, we'll be sharing all of our, the resources with teachers. Many teachers already have access to these resources. And we've created additional resources and identified additional technology tools to really support effective teaching and learning going into the fall. So again, hundreds of teachers working on this. So a great thanks to them. There was a separate group that was working through the logistics. Administrators and some teachers were also working through what schedules might look like. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that as we get a little further into the presentation. One thing that we really thought about as we planned was thinking about what are the ways that we look at education that we might really think about changes that we could bring for the positive in this challenging situation. So we really thought about what are the best things that we could bring to education and how might our resources and our collaborative work with teachers really bring that to the forefront. We also really focused in on uh, the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSPI, has multiple commitments that they make to districts and to students in our state. This is their first commitment. And as a group, we really thought about this commitment in terms of the resources, the interactions, the professional learning, um, the instructional strategies, everything that we did, we really focused in on how can we think about that commitment and share that commitment with OSPI in our work with students and with teachers. We also did a lot of work in making sure that our, our work and our products were grounded in research. So we looked again at Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSPI. They have very clear guidance for opening schools. We looked at a group called Hanover Research, which provides resources to our district that are research-based that were very, very helpful. And in addition, there are some resources that we're, we're diving into as a district, which you'll hear about soon. Um, but one of them was looking at these, these books by these authors here that were very much guided in research and in practice. So there are things that they're wonderful uh, proven ideas that we'll be able to bring to your students on a daily basis as we go into the fall. One of our organizing um, components was called Universal Design for Learning. And Universal Design for Learning is something that we've been working with as a district for some time to different levels. But as we go into this type of learning, this remote learning and potentially blended learning, we really thought about how do we design a system and then lessons and units and structures that allow all students access points that will help all of them be successful and not leave it to chance. I share it with you because it is the way that we are designing our lessons and our units as we, as we move into the fall. And really briefly, what the Universal Design for Learning asks is, we need to think about different ways students can access learning. So in a typical week uh, or in a typical lesson, we will look to provide students with books, videos, podcasts, um, readings, interviews, different ways that they can get the information that they need for learning. And then in our second bucket, thinking about representation, different ways that students are interacting with the knowledge maybe a Socratic seminar in their classroom, in their, in their remote learning classroom. Maybe it's a, a collaborative project using OneNote or Teams. What are the different ways that students can interact with the knowledge and that all students see relevance in a pathway in that? And then again, thinking flexibly for the last, the last big bucket for action expression, how can kids represent their learning in ways that really show their passion and their expertise and their progress on standards in a remote learning environment. So perhaps it's a presentation or a podcast or a recording or a paper, all those different things. So we thought about as we plan this flexible um, structure for learning so that all students, no matter what their situation, no matter where they are, have genuine relevant access to learning. We also based our learning on a book called The Distance Learning Playbook. And Emily Young, our Director of Professional Learning, will talk more about this later. But it really aligns with our work around universal design for learning and effective instruction. We as a district also had uh, a significant, a large number of teachers read a book called 10 Mind Frames for Visible Learning. 
And as you can see, the statements here are very student-centered and positive impact. And we thought about that a lot as we planned to think about how can every student say these statements and have them be true in their learning for the 2021 school year. As we worked together in task force groups and our larger task force and in the content areas, these were our common elements, these were our drivers. These are what we grounded our thinking on so that the experience that students had really was relevant, deep, thoughtful, and something that was able to transfer to learning in multiple areas and built their instructional skills, built their knowledge and skills. One of the things that we thought about quite a bit was um, not coming at this, this situation where we're in remote learning from a deficit model, like what are students missing, but really thinking, how can we accelerate their learning? How can we make sure that what they learn is of absolute importance and relevance and that they're empowered as they move along with it? So the, our secondary academic planning teams had several uh, guidance and recommendations. These are the general categories, and I'll go through them more specifically with the resources and recommendations. So questions that you might have are one, very naturally, what will your, what will your students learn this year? So our work groups uh, really looked at the content areas, especially the core content areas, and we modified but did not lower the standards and learning targets for the school year. We're providing uh, pacing guides for teachers that are modified as well so that we really focus in on what's essential for students that are standards aligned and will ensure their success in the next level of learning. We looked, OSPI has guidance uh, around those standards from Achieve the Core. We also really looked at from our teacher lens, so from the, the national lens and the standards lens, but from our teacher lens, what's really important in the classrooms and made sure that was included in there. And then we really thought about and looked at those external standards of what do they need for that next level of learning, that AP course, um, perhaps if you have a senior heading off to college or heading off to their next career objective, what we've really focused and given guidance to teachers on what the essential learnings are for their courses this year. And we're providing them opportunities to collaborate as well and solidify that. Another question you might have is what resources might teachers use to teach? Absolutely, we'll use our adopted curriculum. And with much of our adopted curriculum is available digitally, but we're able to provide, um, for when it's not digital, we'll provide them with a textbook. If it is digital, then we've got that set and we're making sure all students have access to that. We're also identifying supplemental resources. The resources that we have adopted were best suited for an in-class experience and we're adapting them and adding to them so that our students will have access to just terrific resources. And as you'll hear later tonight, um, we have some fantastic use of technology that's really helping technology um, amplify the impact of any learning and really be a transformative force in students' learning. Another question you might have is how might highly interactive courses um, like science or orchestra or band or choir be taught? Our teachers, again, are working on multiple ways of thinking about how students might learn that. Again, and thinking about those flexible buckets of instruction. So the teachers, again, are gonna focus on the essential standards or the frameworks if it's CTE current technical education. And we're continuing to think about what are ways that students can access the essential learning and really engage in it without missing anything. So for a choir teacher, they might provide, um, and there's some wonderful examples out there that you'll see when um, syllabi and lessons start coming home, wonderful examples of students being able to choose between two or three different activities for a warm up, and then two or three different activities for the core learning, and two or three different ways they can represent their learning. So our teachers are actively thinking outside a normal classroom box and into ways that students can actively experience wonderful learning in any format that it comes in. You'll hear more about the career and technical education a little bit later in the presentation from Danita Armas. Other questions you might have is how might your student be assessed and get feedback from your teachers? Again, there are many methods that we've been using that we'll continue to be able to use successfully in a classroom. And we're thinking flexibly about ways that don't really work for us anymore. So there are still things like written assignments and projects and presentations, recordings. Um, again, the use of technology is gonna be really exciting and wonderful and kids being able to use their voice and have some choice in what they're able to do. Teachers will be directly working with students in, in, their, in their virtual classrooms. And so they'll be able to observe students in their um, group discussions or anything like that. We'll also have the opportunity to provide small group work. So there's many different ways that students can assess, that teachers can assess students and give them feedback. We will be using the traditional grading scale this year. OSPI has changed their guidance from the spring. Uh, we're in a different situation this fall. We definitely know that in this remote environment, since some of the ways that we've assessed and graded students before and given feedback are not really options, we don't have secure testing environments. We're not planning on, on those at this time. We really need to continue to think about how can we um, help students understand their progress on standards and how do we reflect that accurately in the grades that we give them and in giving them feedback so they know how to manage their learning as well. 
So this is just a statement from OSPI that really kind of gives more weight to that charge, that we really need to look at what works in assessing and grading, what's really meaningful for students in feedback and what helps their learning. So our work with the distance learning playbook that I mentioned earlier, that book by John Hattie, Doug Fisher, and Nancy Frey, has some wonderful resources for us to think about and implement as a system how we might really move our assessment and our feedback to kids, to students, that, to students in a way that's really powerful for their learning. So we had a group that was part of the, uh, a work group that was part of our, our larger secondary task force that really looked at grading. This was something that, especially in a remote environment, we thought was very important to think about deeply. And we're working, we'll be working with teachers next week, but these six principles uh, for assessment, grading, and feedback, we felt were really important to be able to clearly name and say this is where we want to make sure we're thinking as educators about the importance of grading and assessment and feedback and the power that has in moving students forward and recognizing all of the different ways it can go. So we'll do more work on this in the fall, but I wanted to share these principles with you because they're so core to the way that we're thinking about students and helping them be successful in this remote learning environment. So something you're probably very curious about is what does an actual school day look like and what will my student actually experience? So the drivers, the, the guiding principles for the secondary schedule design were these. Absolutely, teachers and students need to connect directly. That's part of the plan that, we're, that we have for the fall. Schedules also need to think about students being on screen time all day. That a, a nine to four time period of being on screen all the time is not um, helpful for students and doesn't allow for the way that they learn and some voice and choice in their own learning. So there needs to be some flexibility and there needs to be some thinking about how might students, even when they're not on screen, how are they engaging in rich depth of learning as well. And students also need to be able to connect with their teachers outside of a class time, just like they would in a regular school day. They need the, the, the virtual ability to stop by the classroom for additional help. So those are some of the, the philosophical tenets of, of the schedule design that we'll share with you. The other pieces just generally that we thought about were a schedule needs to be able to allow for synchronous instruction, small groups, asynchronous, teacher connection and support, and then again, the ability for those technology tools and support to come into play. So I'm sharing with you a sample middle school schedule. Most of our middle schools will have a schedule that looks mostly like this with a little bit of tweaks to fit their actual school needs. So as you can see, um, the synchronous times, there's synchronous times built in. So a Monday would have period one, uh, period three and period five with a time for intervention and homeroom. One of the things that we really thought about and built into the schedule was times for students to connect to teachers in ways that were not directly related to instruction building that sense of community, giving students a way to feel like they have a home and they can connect to their teacher and each other is so essential in or outside of the school building. And so we wanted to make sure that was part of the school day. So you can also see that we've got time for the actual class periods where the teachers will be engaged in a variety, variety of different strategies for direct inst for instruction, direct instruction or other strategies. And then in different parts of the day, there's time for that asynchronous support and time for direct support. The high school schedule looks fairly similar. It's got seven periods, so it's broken up a little bit differently. But the, as you can see, the first, third, fifth, and seventh periods are on Monday, Tuesdays, two, four, six. Um, and then we've added in some additional time, not an eighth period, but we've added in some additional time into the schedule so that, again, students have that ability to connect with teachers in small groups um, in order to get additional support or in different flexible groupings or get support in different ways. So the schedules, again, are built for the students to be able to have some, some synchronous time with their teachers, some expected daily synchronous time, and some asynchronous time. Wednesdays will all be asynchronous, meaning that the, the teachers will not be directly presenting. Teachers before or by Wednesday will be providing students with the work to do on that day or throughout that week so that they can do it as best fits their family schedule. So I've been using the phrases synchronous instruction and asynchronous quite a bit. Synchronous instruction is where the teacher is actually delivering real-time instruction via Microsoft Teams to the whole class or small groups or individual students. And there might be different ways that that looks, um, but often computer time might be included as well. Asynchronous is when the students are doing work that's been designed by the teacher, but they're not directly in front of a camera or they're directly with their teacher at that time. Students are able to complete asynchronous work when it really works for their family. We knew it was very important to have that flexibility built in. What a day might look like or what a week might look like is in first period, your student might get 15 minutes of, perhaps it's a lecture, perhaps it's the beginning of a discussion, of that direct connection, that direct um, instruction from their teacher. 
the teacher might then say, um, the students will have 15 minutes to go read a passage and be able to come back and then engage back in into the um, into the discussion. So the teachers are also going to be very mindful about what are the best strategies and structure for the different blocks of time that really support student learning. We're fairly certain that your student is not going to have 60 minutes of lecture at a time because they're being very thoughtful again about this mode of learning um, when we're virtual it needs very thoughtful intentional use of every minute so that students are able to have find that relevance and engage deeply. So some other things that we wanted to share with you that we've gone through our curriculum and our resources, we've gone through grading and assessment, we've gone through the schedule. Some of the things that we wanted to share with you that we're actually really excited about in terms of thinking about how students feel about school and how they are very successful in school. So one of the things that we talked about quite a bit in our larger group was that it's really important for students to know how to learn. In a remote learning environment, we can make no assumptions about their ability to use technology. Um, we know that they'll need some support in being able to manage their time. That's a big challenge for them. So we know that we'll need to work with them directly on how do you advocate for yourself? How do you schedule yourself? How do you write emails to your teachers or, sorry, if you're on Teams with your teachers? Uh, how do you work with students? What are some of the ways that people who are successful in a remote environment, what are the behaviors that they have? So our team developed five lessons to be taught over the first two weeks, five short lessons, they're just mini lessons, that really help students be able to access all of the tools of their virtual world in a way that's really effective. Technology integration is presenting later tonight. You will hear lots more about that and about your ability as a parent to learn and engage as well in that. And our goal again is increasing opportunity and access for all students. We don't want students being so frustrated by the process that they don't engage in the learning. So that's the goal of these tools. These are the, the actual lessons that we have that we're, we'll be teaching your students. And again, they'll directly align with what technology integration is going to share with you later. The other piece that we thought about was that um, this is a different environment and that, again, that we know it's a different environment, but that, again, teaching students how to learn is essential and helping them recognize their own motivation, um, what positive behaviors look like, how they are empowered and responsible for their learning, and that we will support that and we'll teach them how to have ownership over that. So again, our goal is to increase opportunity and access for all students. So we've created just some simple tools that we'll add to over the year that help students think about their own learning and how they can move forward. Teachers, again, can share these in mini lessons with students so that they're able to plan for their own, um, their own empowerment, really. And here's a sample of just uh, two of the different um, elements that we we're thinking about. So we we're looking at like, what are the way, what are the things that we want to help students really understand these are the behaviors and dispositions of students who are successful online and have it be something that we actively think about if we want them to know it, then it's something we really have to support with instruction. So we're excited about being able to support your students from that, uh, all sides of academics, from the content and the resources and the curriculum, um, all the way to thinking about the technology tools the, um, and the ways that they think about their own learning and to be able to make sure that they're empowered and just feeling wonderful about this year. It is a tough time, but we're so excited to welcome your students back and feel like we have great resources and fantastic teachers and administrators ready to support them. And with that, I'd like to introduce Becky Katamas, who will talk to us a little bit about advanced placement and what's going on there. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Becky Katamas. I'm the director of Accelerated Programs, and I'm thrilled to be with you tonight. I'm going to be speaking directly about um, advanced placement. And I want to kind of just do a quick recap and remind us that last year when we closed um, very quickly, <clears throat> the, acceler or the advanced placement courses became um, an interesting land to live in because College Board had to make some shifts in what the exams looked like, how they were administered, um, resources that were avail normally available, paper, pencil, that suddenly had to be um, changed and moved online, and we survived all of that. We had thousands of exams that were completed within Lake Washington, and we had a very high pass rate. We're really excited about how we made it through that, but we also know that we're starting off a new year virtually, and we are ready and more prepared for our um, advanced placement courses. So College Board has done a lot of work over the summer. Our teachers have been working in the remote secondary task force, and I just want to share a few changes or a few updates is really what it is. Um, our advanced placement courses will be following the same expectations that all of our secondary core academic um, classes will have that Dr. Rose just shared with you. We have um, several online resources from College Board that 
are going to support not only our students but our teachers. The a year ago they rewrote the sequence for our courses and this year there will be an effect and they're called the units of study. All of our teachers now have access to those scope and sequences so we will see some shifts in which units occur at which time of year. We'll want to make sure that we are in line with that um, so that if exams are altered in any way that we are on, on course with College Board and ensure our students have the right um, content that has been covered. Last year we struggled a little bit with the videos. We, we came around to the other side and tech, our tech department was fabulous to help us come up with a workaround. Um, but I'm excited to say that College Board has moved all of their videos to their online platform which is called AP Central. So our students will have all of the uh, access to all of those videos um, right there on that um, safe platform and they won't be on YouTube. The students will join um, AP Central courses in the first week or so of school. They use a join code to go in and sign up for each of their courses and then they will have direct access to those. College Board has been working over the summer to add to that bank of videos. So they will start with Unit 1 um, beginning September 1 and we'll have ongoing videos added to their video library. Those videos will be short snippets. It could be 8 minutes, could be 15 minutes, but they will help students um, shore up any misconceptions they may have or make sure that they are firmly understanding the concepts that are being um, taught within their course. The dashboard within AP Central also offers an opportunity for teachers to use the assessment tools that are built in to um, give students small quizzes or checks for understanding and then the dashboard gives the teacher a quick understanding of how the students are doing in each of the classes and what things um, need to be retaught or what what concepts have already been mastered and they can move forward. We are, believe it or not, gearing up again for um, registering for AP exams this fall and that moved a year ago so we will be signing up in September College Board in the past has always charged a um, cancellation fee. They have dropped that for the 2021 school year, which is wonderful, which means students can sign up for in any or all of their AP courses exams. And then if they change their mind or something different happens, they can cancel and will, there will, they will get their refund. The sign up time will be September 7th through September 24th for the exams. And then we will be doing payment for the exams um, between September 25th and October 30th. You will receive a ton of information regarding how to sign up for the exams and how to pay for the exams through your individual high schools. But I just want to kind of give you a little plug for that. They still have a late fee, so it really is important for you to take the time um, to get signed up here in, in September and early October. The in addition to everything else that's going on in AP, we have done a lot of work to ensure that we have resources for our AP teachers that are housed on our district team sites and also in AP classroom. We are encouraging cross-building um, collaboration with our AP classes so that we see um, cons consistency within each of the courses. And then we have been working to provide additional remote resources for courses that um, are used to a brick and mortar, paper, pencil, um, and textbook type of learning experience. So very excited to get started this year. We have all sorts of great things ready for our, our advanced placement students. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to Donita Orimas, Director of College and Career Readiness. Hi everyone, uh, good evening, thanks for joining us. I am Donita Remus, Director of College and Career Readiness, and I'm excited to tell you about some updates in the world of career and technical education. Along with the other studies, we will be conducting our remote learning expectations to run parallel with the secondary core academics. So our instructional focus will be on all CTE courses being that are scheduled to be offered, will be offered in the 2021 school year. However, if there are any changes, we're asking that you, um, contact your high school and you'll be notified if, if there's any scheduling changes. 
The other focus would be the district-wide instructional frameworks. We will be focusing on our units of study, and that will include our core industry competencies. If we have any credit equivalencies that are offered through our CT programs, and also any dual college credit content. So those will be the main instructional focuses. And then for the hands-on or extended learning opportunities, we wanted to make sure that that lab opportunity, if at all available, we can provide that. And that would be through some of our online and new curriculum that we're providing. We have some online site experiences that are going to be very exciting for the students. And then also looking into the options of providing either kits or home um, provided experiences for your students to participate in. As far as the collaboration and support for our instructors, we always are very collaborative in the world of career and technical education. So that collaboration will continue through supports for our, from our instructional specialists from each one of our teams. And all of the teachers will have that for an ongoing basis throughout the year as well as teachers will have an opportunity to participate district-wide with that collaboration. And we're also setting up a county-wide unit. So we're looking for those best practices in career and technical education so that we know that we can provide our Lake Washington students with the best experience possible. The other additional areas that I oversee include the high school and beyond plan, the HSBP, and college dual credit, and then also the career specialist. So I just want you to know that OSPI is still having us do the High School and Beyond plan for all of our students. We use the Zello platform for the students to complete that. They all have access to that. And at each one of the high schools, we have a High School and Beyond plan coordinator who can help facilitate that and answer any questions that might come up. The career specialists in each high school also would pro will be providing their regular information just through a remote option, and that will include things like FAFSA information nights, so financial aid information nights, um, career information nights, college contact nights, those types of things will still be happening, and you'll be getting plenty of information about that. We'll just be doing it, of course, through a remote venue. So just in case you're saying, what is this career and technical edge he's talking about, CTE? So here are some of the classes that we offer at the middle school level. So if you're seeing any of these classes or if you have any questions about any of these classes, again, please reach out to your schools. They know what your student schedules are. They can help you to understand and navigate whether or not your student is in a CTE, career and technical education course. These are the middle school offerings. And these are our extensive high school offerings. So you can see we have a wide, wide variety here. I, I won't uh, go through all of them, but if there's something that interests your student either now or possibly in the future, rest assured we probably offer it in our district. So I wanted to give you just a brief update on the WANIC Skill Center. So WANIC is planning on offering all of their regular courses in the 2021 school year. They will also be having the same types of remote focus that I that I shared with you about our current technical education courses. And I've noted down below um, where the different courses are offered because WANIC has a core campus. And then we also have a lot of different satellite campuses where your students as Lake Washington students do have the option to participate in those. Now, should there happen to be any kind of scheduling change, you will be notified. And the scheduling changes will actually occur through your student's home high school, but you will be notified by WANIC as well. So you'll get lots of information about that. If you have any additional questions about WANIC, we have a new director. Her name is Carrie Shu, and I put her information down at the bottom of this slide. And her information is also on the Lake Washington website, and a link to the WANIC website is available there as well. So with that information and all of that overview of the wonderful options for current technical education, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Emily Young. Hi, I'm Emily. Oh, am I on? Hi, I'm Emily Young, the Director of Professional Learning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight briefly about our professional learning plan. We know that the need for professional learning is higher than ever before 
with um, everything that is happening in the world and uh, the need for our staff to start school remotely for the first time. Lake Washington is known throughout the region for providing comprehensive professional learning for our educators and staff. And it's the reason why a lot of people choose to come work in this district. So we know that we are well prepared to extend those supports and um, make them meaningful in a remote context. Over the spring and summer, Lake Washington gathered feedback from parents, students, teachers, and staff members, as well as local and national education organizations to fully understand and help us address the professional learning needs of our staff. Our professional learning plan for employees focuses on building educators' capacity in the areas of equity, remote instruction, safety and health training, flexible, adaptive curriculum design that gives students multiple ways to show what they're learning and ways to make learning visible in a remote setting. Dr. Jen Rose spoke about some of these a few minutes ago. All teachers in the district will complete more than six days of professional learning before school begins with more learning to come once school is underway. Additionally, teachers who are new to the district are currently in the middle of completing an extra week and a half of professional learning, which will allow them to kind of hit the ground running and be immediately effective in the district. While this uh, professional learning plan has a number of strands, it is tied together with our focus on supporting all students and helping all students be effective and be challenged in their courses and doing so in a remote context. To that end, Lake Washington has purchased a foundational resource for all educators in the district. It's called the Distance Learning Playbook by Douglas Fisher, Nancy Frey, and John Hattie. This book, which is by highly regarded education researchers, provides a really strong foundation in remote instruction with a particular focus on building relationships and um, ensuring instructional clarity, developing engaging tasks. It's a book that came out this July and includes up to the moment research on remote learning best practices. So we know that it will be highly impactful for our staff. We are also very excited to announce that one of the authors, John Hattie, is leading a keynote presentation for all educators in the district next week before school begins. Lake Washington is also developing professional learning for our classified employees, such as our paraeducators, instructional assistants, to help them support the needs of our students and families in this complex time. As the school year begins, Lake Washington will be assessing the ongoing professional learning needs of our staff and providing differentiated professional learning um, that will take a number of different forms that could include or will include e-learning and instructor-led training and book studies, webinars, inquiry cohorts, and collaborative time that our teachers need to work in concert to meet the needs of our students. Lake Washington is deeply committed to serving our students and we are really excited to deliver on our mission and vision in every context, helping all of our students graduate future ready. I, with that, I will turn things over to our Associate Superintendent, Sally Askman. Hello everyone, thank you, Emily. Um, to you, our community, thank you for taking time this evening to learn about our plans for technology access, our learning platform, Microsoft Classroom Teams, our training resources, and family and student support. Over the next few minutes, you'll hear from Forrest Baker, our Director of Technology Operations, on student computers, technical support enhancements for families and students, and internet connections for those families who are not yet connected to the internet from home. Mindy Mallon, our Director of Technology Integration, will then highlight the parent and student view of classroom teams and parent training and support to help you engage with students and their learning. Our teachers have spent many hours over the summer honing their classroom team skills and preparing for back to school. Our technical teams have automated the creation of over 10,000 classroom teams where students will be enrolled with their assigned teachers. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to Forrest Baker, Director of Technical Technology Operations. 
Thank you very much, Sally, and good evening. My name is Forrest Baker, and I am the Director of Technology Operations for Lake Washington School District. So I'd like to touch on a few technology services and family support options we are providing our families this school year. Laptops for all students. Thank you. <clears throat> First and foremost, Lake Washington is committed to providing a district laptop to all students for remote instruction. Schools are currently notifying our families with scheduled dates and times for a safe technology checkout process before school begins. A parent or guardian does have the choice of opting out from using the district laptop if they have a preferred device already available for their child's schoolwork that may better meet their personal circumstances. <clears throat> but I think it's important to note that experiences on the Lake Washington School District student laptops may at times offer additional resources or closer alignment of software experiences between the teacher and the student. So internet hotspots. Uh, Lake Washington is also prepared to provide internet access to our students that do not already have internet service in their home. Families just need to request a wireless hotspot from their child's school and then can check it out through the same process as a laptop. It's important to note that if you do already have wireless internet in your home, that adding in a mobile hotspot will not enhance your internet user experience. We are also listing on our website low-cost internet options related to the COVID-19 pandemic that are available with local internet service providers in our community. Training and support. So in order to respond to anticipated uh, support needs, we are enhancing our technical support with expanded hours and more staff to answer phone calls and respond to emails to assist our families. That includes offering help desk support from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., as well as weekend hours with both phone and email options available. <clears throat> Uh, we are also exploring additional self-help options through automation and online chat. And if there is a need for laptop repair, that will be determined by our technical support team. And your child's school will be the location for laptop repair and exchange pickup and drop off. There are also training videos for parents and guardians on using classroom teams that will be posted before school begins followed by webinars on basics of classroom teams and other topics in early September, as well as Office 365 support and information. So thank you for your time this evening and please take note of the Family Access Help Desk email address and phone number at the end of this presentation. So I'll now turn the screen over to Mindy. Good evening, everyone. Um, as indicated, my name is Melinda Mallon, or Mindy Mallon. I'm the Director of Technology Integration for our district. I'm going to be talking to you tonight about classroom teams, the new schoolroom for our students and teachers this fall. Our why for moving to a single instructional platform serves that overarching goal of providing space, a space for quality instruction for our students and our teachers. We have heard loud and clear from community staff and students that working between multiple platforms and communication systems was challenging and overwhelming and ultimately served as a distraction for learning. Last spring, we introduced Microsoft Classroom Teams to implement the support for connection and engagement with our students. This school year, Classroom Teams will be fully utilized to support quality instructional delivery at all grade levels, K-12. We know that serving our students in a remote learning environment creates many challenges, but our goal in using classroom teams is to look for those opportunities and capitalize those in this time of remote learning. In preparing for intentional and meaningful instructional delivery, the full implementation of classroom teams will be essential. So let me talk to you a little bit about what does classroom teams environment include. We mentioned that the idea of connection and communication was something we started last spring. And so this year we're really moving into that instructional delivery, a really strong collaboration and engagement. 
So what classroom teams will offer us is an opportunity for both synchronous and asynchronous learning, which was explained earlier in the evening, for video storage of lesson information and to be shared with students, communication options. It also allows for embedded collaboration, engagement, and assessment features, which are essential um, to our instruction. The other thing that it provides is a storage place for our resources for our students and teachers in one place. This platform will support not only remote learning, but also <coughs> a hybrid or in-person model, which we know that in our current situation, we may have to move between as the year progresses. Transitioning to one platform takes time and training. Valuable instructional resources need to be moved and new instructional delivery approaches will be needed. This requires in-depth professional learning as Emily shared. In order to support our teachers with the transition to teams, we have offered, uh, we have collaborated with the Lake Washington Education Association to provide time for our teachers to engage in this training over the summer. So some of that training directly related to classroom teams has included uh, what we're calling classroom teams for instruction. So it's new learning from the spring at four hours. And then we also have a course called learning planning and application for remote learning in classroom teams as a two hour training. We know that this professional learning will need to be ongoing and we have already planned for that as we move into the school year. And that will be handled on our, I mentioned that um, leap time here, our leap time is our early release days in which teachers engage in professional learning. So in a few minutes, we're gonna share with you the short video that we talked about that will provide that tour of the classroom team site. And this will provide a glimpse into the new school room that our students will be working within. Before I share that with you, I wanna talk about some unique features that classroom teams provides um, because it addresses some of those challenges that we experienced last spring. So one of the, um, one of the most outstanding features uh, is that many of our core, what we call instructional technology tools or tools that support instruction across all content areas, delivery of instruction are embedded within the classroom team's environment. And what that means is that neither teachers nor students need to leave the environment to access some of these tools that they have previously used. So it makes it very smooth. It's one less place for students um, to have to um, interact with. And so it helps streamline. And many of those tools support collaboration, assessment, content delivery, and engagement. Some of you might be aware that our district has been in the process of implementing new interactive panels in our schools over the past three years. And with that um, implementation came um, some software and uh, online resources through smart technologies. We have worked closely with Microsoft and Smart and that tool is now directly embedded within classroom teams. And it is a wonderful resource that offers all types of engagement and collaboration in a very visual format. And we know that this is gonna be a very valuable tool for our teachers. Some of you might have also experienced Flipgrid this past spring. Flipgrid is a very um, uh, popular uh, visual interactive tool that can be used to support engagement, uh, communication, and assessment. And, and you might have seen a video where there was an interaction between the teacher and the student where the student might have created a small video that the, uh, they send back to the teacher and the whole class can engage in that. And that's a very powerful tool. Discovery Education is another example. That tool has been a part of our repertoire for several years now, but it provides a wide range of video content to support instruction across all areas. It has new resources related to project-based learning. It provides collaboration spaces, and again, is directly linked with Inside Classroom Teams. And of course, all of our Office 365 applications that our students have been working in um, for many years are uh, embedded right within classroom teams. I want to talk to you a little bit more about the embedded classroom notebook. All of our students come to school with a notebook that they work within for their different classes, and it's a way to be organized. The embedded classroom notebook is a digital notebook that our students will be working in as they move into this school year. So there's some really important components of that notebook. One is that it provides a content library, that is static information that the teacher may um, load into this notebook. It's a read-only section and provides um, a place for 
uh, content to be stored that students may need to access. This is similar to what you might have seen in PowerSchool Learning. It's a place where teachers put information. It also includes, includes a collaboration space, and this collaboration space within the notebook provides a space that students may work on a document at the same time, they may work on a project at the same time, in live, in real time, so it could be a small group or it could be two students and all under the purview of the teacher. It also provides an individual private student section. And so the beauty of that is only the student and the teacher see that section and it allows for communication, private communication back and forth with the student in relationship to assignments. It also allows um, the teacher and the student to use the features such as digital inking, video, a teacher could record a video to send feedback to a student on a certain project, which enhances that connection with students and uh, obviously text features. And then the last feature, which is so important for um, many of our students, is the accessibility features that are, again, built into the Classroom Teams environment. So students do not need to go outside of the environment to get the support they need to access the content that the teacher is presenting. So some of those tools include the Immersive Reader. And the Immersive Reader is a tool that provides um, dictation and voice options. A student could adjust the speed. Um, it has a picture dictionary and text options, spacing, so many different things that um, students may need to help them access the content. It also provides live closed captioning for meetings. So if a teacher is speaking, it will provide text alongside the instruction so that students who may need to see text who may have trouble hearing have access to that. Visual things are included, so you could, inc uh, you could increase the contrast, have a dark mode, um, and different visual preferences are available. And then another really important uh, accessibility feature is translation. So within the Classroom Team site, um, students could translate sections of the notebook or sections of even a post that a teacher might create into the language of their choice if language was a barrier. Classroom Teams includes very specific features which will assist in family communication. Uh, I talked a little bit about that content library, and within the content library, um, this is a space that uh, teachers are teachers will send links to uh, their parents, and the parents will have a landing page, we're calling it, within this uh, content library that will be titled Information for Families, and it's a specific section. And within that section will be uh, three pages. One will be the welcome page, and this will be a standard template that all of our teachers will complete and fill out so parents will see consistency from one uh, classroom team site to another. And then at the second page, we'll share digital resources specific to that course or grade level. And then the third page will be the weekly learning plans that have been discussed by uh, our elementary and secondary teaching and learning teams. And then the second very cool feature is that um, there is an assignment function within Classroom Teams. And what that does is it creates a weekly Guardian Digest, which indicates activities and assignments that have been um, assigned to your student um, from various subject areas. It's generated per student. This is an example of what it looks like. And it will include the assignments that have been posted through Classroom Teams. This is a feature that our teachers are just learning about, um, and it's something we will continue training on over the next several months. Uh, Skyward will continue to serve as our official record for attendance and grading, so we will still be relying on that resource. As we begin this fall, we will be learning more about how to best utilize the assignment feature within Classroom Teams in alignment with our grading within Skyward. So we also know that support for our families in learning how to access these resources is going to be very important. So I'm going to um, pop into that video in just a second and share that with you. But I wanted to just mention that this video that you're going to see is also going to be produced in different languages. We are going to be providing support documents in different languages in a text format for our families. And then um, we are also planning for a live community event in early September where we will be providing training for our families who are interested in a live event. 
So without further ado, I would like to share with you our first tutorial. Uh, we are very excited about this tutorial and believe that our families will find this very valuable. This is the Lake Washington School District Family and Guardian Guide to Microsoft Classroom Teams. Everything your student needs to know to get started with online learning. Dear families and guardians, we want you to know that we hear you. Your involvement in your student's education is more important than ever. On top of juggling work and personal responsibilities and ensuring that your family stays safe and healthy, you're now assisting in remote learning. You have a lot on your plate. Lake Washington School District is committed to education in this remote environment. Give it just a second. This guide will cover how to set up and get started using Microsoft Classroom Teams so that your student can continue learning and connecting with their teacher and class. The adoption of Microsoft Classroom Teams aligns with our mission to ensure that all Lake Washington School District students are future ready. This presentation will cover four main areas. In chapter one, We'll talk about two ways that your student can access their classroom teams. Chapter two will cover ways in which you can help support your student. Chapter three will talk about family and guardian communication. Our final chapter will cover some tips and tricks to help your student with easy troubleshooting. If you're using the PowerPoint version of this presentation, feel free to click a link on this page to jump to that topic. If you're watching a video of this presentation, feel free to fast forward to your area of interest. There are two ways your student can access their classroom teams. First, we'll look at how they can sign into Teams online. They just need to type teams.microsoft.com into the address bar of their internet browser and sign in when prompted. prompted. If they're signing in for the first time, have your student type their LWSD email address into the first sign-in screen. They will then be prompted to enter their LWSD password on the next screen. Once logged in, your student is now ready to use Teams Online. Classroom Teams can also be accessed through the Teams desktop app that is available on every district-issued device. If your student prefers to use the desktop app, just have them double-click the Teams app icon from their list of applications. Have them enter their LWSD student login and password if prompted to do so. Then, they're all set. Let's cover some ways in which you can support your students as they use Teams. The first of which is how they will access their classroom Teams. Once Teams opens, your student will see their available classroom Teams arranged as tiles. They can access any classroom team by simply clicking the tile associated with the class. Please note that the number of teams may differ per student based upon their unique needs and or grade level. After the classroom team is selected, your student will see channels that the teacher has created. These might be subjects, units, or other labels. Microsoft Classroom Teams and Microsoft OneNote make a perfect pair. Every classroom team comes with an integrated class notebook that can be accessed by your student within Teams. On the general channel of every classroom team, there is a class notebook tab where your student will be able to access their class notebook and personalized section associated with that classroom team. Classroom Teams allows teachers to create assignments for students to view, add their work, and then turn in. Assignments can be viewed and submitted many ways on Teams. Let's cover some common options that students have for completing assignments. To view all assignments for a classroom team, Students can go to the general channel of that team and select the Assignments tab. From there, they can choose a specific assignment. If your student needs to upload their work, they can select the little paperclip icon to add their work to the assignment. Students can upload work from many sources, like from their OneDrive, from their device's hard drive, an existing file within Teams, or they can create a new file to work on right within the Upload menu. In this example, 
Let's have our student upload a file from their device by clicking Upload from this device. This would be an existing file that is already saved to their computer. Navigate to the file's location on the computer and click Open. Once Teams indicates that the file has successfully uploaded, click Done. And now there's just one more step, and it's a fun one. Now that all their work has been submitted, your student must click the Turn In button to indicate to their teacher that they have officially submitted their assignment. This will trigger a fun randomized animation to let the student know that they've successfully turned in their assignment. Could turning in assignments be more fun? Now we'll talk about how your student will be participating in virtual meetings with their teachers and classmates. When your students attend their virtual classroom team's meetings, they can customize their experience with video and microphone settings as needed. To join a meeting, your student can click on the calendar to the left side of the team's window and select the scheduled meeting from the calendar. Click the Join button in the upper right-hand corner to launch the meeting window. Before entering the meeting, your student can select to turn their camera and microphone off before clicking Join Now. When joining the meeting, your student might enter a virtual lobby where they will wait until the teacher starts the meeting and admits students who are waiting. Let's touch briefly on the Grades tab. Your student can use the Grades tab to check on assignment status with an easy-to-read quick view list. The Grades tab is located on the general channel of every classroom team. While the Grades tab does connect to assignments and may show points and scores, Skyward will still be the most accurate source for grade reporting for LWSD students and teachers. Family and guardian communication about classroom teams activity will be sent out in two ways. The first of which is the weekly Guardian Digest. Guardians will automatically receive a weekly Guardian Digest via email that outlines the classroom team's assignments your student turned in that week, assignments that are still pending, and assignments that are due the following week. These are sent out every Sunday to the Guardian email we have on file in Skyward and are automated per registered student. Here's an example of what the Guardian Digest looks like on a tablet. Another way in which guardians can be aware of what's going on in their student's class is by accessing the content library of the class notebook. Families and guardians can access the content library of the class notebook whenever they choose by clicking a special link shared by the teacher at the beginning of the term. Teachers will use the content library to provide up-to-date information and content related to their class. Next, we'll cover some questions that may come up, as well as a few troubleshooting techniques to help support your student. What if your student's login isn't working? This error message could display for a couple of reasons. It could be that the login information that was typed may not be accurate, or there might be some other issue with your student's account. If you verify that the login ID and passwords are correct, please have your student contact their teacher or family helpline with questions. What if your student can't find their classroom teams during setup, or there are no classroom teams present? If your student does not see their class or classes after logging in, the teacher may not have activated the team yet. If you feel that this is an error, please let the teacher know so that they can take the necessary action. What if your student's assignments are missing? In this case, it could be that there are not any assignments assigned to your student. If they don't see any assignments but feel that they should, have your student email the teacher. What if you have more than one student that want to use the same district device? Each student can log into their own Teams account with their unique username and password. When one student is done with their Teams work, click on their icon in the top right corner and select Sign Out. The next student can then log in. What can you do if your student is experiencing low internet bandwidth? Teams can still be used when internet bandwidth is low. It will work to reduce the amount of video streams automatically. Another tip is to try limiting video usage during live class sessions. Have your student turn off their camera while in the meeting and only use the camera when they are called upon to do so. You can also turn off incoming video when bandwidth is low. Have your student click on the More Options ellipsis during the meeting and select Turn Off Incoming Video. Here are some common audio troubleshooting tips. If people in a meeting can't hear your student, they might be muted or the microphone setting might be incorrect. Have your student click the microphone icon to turn the mute button on or off. 
Your student can change their speaker or microphone settings in a meeting by selecting the More Options ellipsis from the toolbar and clicking Device Settings. Your student can then select the speaker and microphone they wish to use from the Audio Device drop-down menus. Lake Washington School District does have some resources to help our families with technology-related issues. You can contact our skilled technology specialists by sending an email to ftaccess at lwsd.org. That's F as in Frank, T as in Tom, access at lwsd.org. Or you can call our parent and student support helpline at area code 425-936-1322. You can also access Microsoft specific support resources at support.microsoft.com. All right, thank you very much. I'm Matt Gillingham, Associate Superintendent for Student and Community Services. Um, tonight, we're gonna um, end our, uh, our uh, presentation with uh, talking about our efforts around uh, protecting the health and well-being of, uh, of those students, staff, and families that uh, are in our care when they come into our, our buildings. And I know we're starting the year for most uh, of our students uh, remotely, but um, our interest is uh, to be prepared so that we can begin to welcome students back. Um, one of the guiding principles that we've been working through um, this, uh, this entire time has been uh, to protect the health and well-being of uh, those, those uh, folks within our care. And uh, we've been working um, you know, back since uh, February 28th when we activated our emergency operations center to uh, ensure that we're able to rapidly and intelligently respond to the challenges that COVID-19 presents us. Um, we've had a team of administrators, nurses, and custodians who've uh, worked tirelessly to ensure that we're, um, we're meeting that obligation. Um, everybody from our purchasing department who's helped us to uh, make sure that we're getting masks and, and uh, uh, supplies uh, to uh, to our custodians who have been working to ensure that every day our, our facilities are clean. Over the summer, our risk and safety team and our support services team led respectively by Scott Emery and Brian Buck have worked to develop comprehensive safety plans for students and staff to return to campuses in alignment with guidance from the CDC, uh, the State Department of Health, uh, Seattle King County Public Health, uh, OSPI, uh, and the Department of Labor of Industries. So it's my pleasure to introduce these two leaders who will share plans about how our staff will work differently this year and how our campuses will look differently as we begin to work our way back to school campuses. We'll first hear from Scott, who's gonna share information regarding our emergency plans. Scott is the uh, Director of Risk and Safety Services. And following Scott will be Brian Buck, who's the Executive Director of Support Services, who will share information regarding our cleaning protocols and facility modifications. Um, thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, it's, uh, it's yours. Great, thank you. Good evening. This is Scott Emery, Director of Risk and Safety Services, as uh, Matt shared with you. I wanna share with you some information about the district's COVID-19 safety plan. We take the safety of our staff, students, visitors, and volunteers very seriously, and we've spent the summer preparing this plan for a safe return to school, whether remote, in-person, or hybrid. These are a few things to remember as I talk with you about the safety plan. First, we have reviewed guidance from Labor and Industries, the CDC, the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, and the Department of Health. 
And our safety plan weaves the guidance from these agencies together to create actionable steps for all of us to take. Second, some of the supplies you will see in this presentation have not arrived yet. Our vendors and suppliers have indicated that these supplies should be here for the start of school. So keep in mind, we're dependent on these supplies arriving so we can get them out to our schools. Third, there are things we haven't predicted. So this safety plan has to be fluid and adapt to changes or new guidance that emerges as we move towards starting school. Even after the start of school, the state, age, the state or other agencies may produce additional guidance for us. And if that happens, we'll review it and incorporate it into our safety plans. So with those things in mind, let's walk through some of the highlights of the safety plan. The COVID-19 safety plan is, written, is a written document that is nearly 50 pages long. It contains the purpose, expectations, guidance, and structure for each school to have their own specific plan that meets the needs of the staff and community while maintaining compliance with district guidance. This safety plan is applied to all staff, students, visitors, and volunteers, and will be used to develop all activities within the school, including any in-person service or distribution of materials. The COVID-19 safety plan is a written document with a multi-layered system of safety. Each of these systems of safety contribute to the reduction of the transmission risk of COVID-19. And it is important to note that we require all of these systems to be in place, not just some of them. These systems are and, not or. As an example, personal health and hygiene. We're all responsible and should be aware of our own health. And if we feel ill, don't come to school or work. And we wash our hands frequently with soap and water. And we wear cloth face coverings and are required, uh, which are required to enter district facilities. And we have physical distancing to be maintained at all times. And we clean our workspaces frequently with supplies provided by the district. And we follow attestation and screening processes, meaning before we go to work and enter the building or before we come to school, when that becomes, um, uh, when we come back to school, we will check for symptoms and screen and take temperatures or will attest to the fact that we have done that. These are all systems in place um, to protect us. And we will have personal protective equipment. So if a face cloth, a cloth face covering isn't um, enough for the tasks that are being completed, the district provides all personal protective equipment necessary to protect our staff and students. And we have workplace procedures and guidance, and it's important that we all follow these safety precautions. Each district facility has a site COVID-19 safety team. This structure was modeled after our incident command system or ICS, which is the system that we use to respond to emergencies already. So it's familiar to us. You'll see that there are responsibilities within the COVID-19 safety plan, and each of these positions or jobs has a description and a list of responsibilities in order to support implementation. Briefly, the COVID supervisor is responsible for all, all aspects of the safety plan until they assign those tasks to someone else. Skipping down to the medical coordinator, this person is responsible for the health room, the quarantine room, and the management of positive cases that may be reported in their building. The attestation coordinator will be responsible that the stations are set up for screening and attestations when that's appropriate. The custodial uh, coordinator will be responsible to ensure that all cleaning protocols are followed, including deep cleaning when positive cases are reported. And finally, the PPE coordinator will be responsible for receiving the monthly shipments of personal protective equipment that the district sends to each school and making sure it's distributed throughout the building to those that need it. 
As stated, in, in addition to these job descriptions for these positions, there are some supplemental guidance documents that we've created. We have procedures on how to wear face coverings, the cloth face coverings and PPE. There's a deeper descri uh, description of how to set up the screening stations and the attestation stations and all the responsibilities that go with doing that job. There is a protocol and process involved in when symptoms or positive cases are reported within any building. And again, the medical coordinator and the custodial coordinator will support those response measures. And finally, any activities or events that might be planned, such as distribution of materials or things like that, um, there is guidance on how schools can set those up and do those safely. So as you can see, these are comprehensive plans that um, provide a structure and a plan for each school to set up their own plan for them. Thank you for taking time to listen to this. I'm confident that if we all do our part, follow the guidance and expectations and support each other through all of these difficult, challenging times, that our safety plan will contribute to lowering the transmission risk while in our facilities. And now it's going to be Brian Buck, Director of Support Services. Okay, hi. Uh, hello again, my name is Brian Buck and I'm the Executive Director of Support Services. Uh, I would also like to take a moment to thank the many people on our team for their effort and the can-do attitude they bring to work each day. This includes our nutrition services and print shop partners, our bus drivers, our warehouse drivers, um, our grounds, maintenance and custodial crews, along with our Capital Projects group. Today, I'm gonna to touch on uh, plexiglass solutions, distancing, signage, and markers, our ventilation plan, cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting, um, a little bit about our buses and classroom setup. As we prepare for our return to school and in-person learning, you will see various plexiglass solutions in place at our schools, primarily in high transactional locations. We have several solutions for countertops and rolling partitions, as well as temporary non-plexiglass shields. All of these solutions are designed to be flexible and relocatable to meet different needs throughout the day. It's important for all of us to do our part by practicing safe distancing, washing our hands, and wearing our masks. Healthy reminder signs will be placed throughout the district in all buildings. We will also place maximum occupancy signs in such areas as elevators, small workrooms, conference rooms, and other as a physical distancing reminder. In the effort to ensure physical distancing, we are reducing areas of congregation as much as possible. Aiding in this effort, along with controlling traffic patterns, will be physical distancing markers such as floor and carpet clings, non-residue tape, and stanchions for secondary schools. Similar, similar to the plexiglass, these solutions are designed to be flexible and relocatable to meet different needs throughout the day. Our ventilation plan aligns with ASHRAE recommendations. ASHRAE stands for the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. The plan calls for maximizing outside air, and we are setting all dampers to 100% outside air while limiting the recirculation of air. We will be balancing um, outside air with thermal comfort. So it will be important to dress appropriately as hot, off, hot afternoons will feel a bit hotter and cold days a bit colder. 
All filters will be changed prior to the start of school, and we will be upgrading the size of our filters to MERV 13 where feasible. Our health rooms, main conference rooms, and bathrooms will directly exhaust air to the outside and run full time during the day. All water lines will be flushed and all P-traps will be primed prior to, the, prior to occupancy. As part of our positive case response, the Remote Operations Center is available 24-7 and is able to uh, update our building controls remotely. We will be performing intensive daily cleaning and disinfection of high touch points and bathrooms throughout the day. As we begin the year fully remote, we will initially be cleaning special education classrooms during the course of the day. All classrooms, shared learning spaces, and office spaces will have spray bottles of cleaner and disinfectant with microfiber cloths. Hand sanitizer will be provided for all classrooms with stations in the front entry and high traffic areas. We have trained and developed a custodial response team for positive case response. The team communicates with the site administration, ensures ventilation is shut down during cleaning, cleans and disinfects all impacted areas with electrostatic spraying, and vacuums all spaces with HEPA filter vacuums. Routes for our initial opening will include preschool and special education students, along with potential nutrition services support. When we return to in-person learning, we will send out physical distancing reminders for the bus stop, while boarding, and during pickup and drop off at school. Electrostatic spraying of buses will occur each evening, along with the cleaning and disinfection of high touch points throughout the day. Classrooms will be set up with physical spacing between students. All desks will be turned to face in the same direction. We, we have many different types of student furniture, so we have inventoried all student desks in all classrooms, and we'll be providing each school with configuration templates for their classrooms. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Holman. Thank you, Brian. First, I would like to thank each of our presenters tonight for sharing information related to their specific areas of responsibility. And thank you to our families, students, staff, and community for attending our live events. I hope you heard throughout our presentations that our focus on the, is on the success of each and every one of our students. We value our partnership with our Lake Washington School District families. We will continue to communicate and update our Return to School Task Force webpage to provide clarity and transportation into our clarity and transparency, excuse me, into our efforts. I want to note that we will be translating our parent videos and resources into multiple languages. We know our community is made up of families from across the world, and we want to make sure that they have access to our resources and information. We cannot wait for the time when we can serve all of our students in person, and we know that we must work through this global health crisis, which has caused all of us to shift and change. We will continue to work toward that plan and toward that outcome. Thank you again for your continued engagement and we appreciate you taking the time to hear about our planning efforts for the school in the fall. Thank you and be well.